Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Dr. X17, Tim Deputy, Brandon Brooks, and new patron Eddie. A perfect day for a new patron. Hey, Eddie. Good job, Eddie. On this episode of DTNS, Mozilla will sell you privacy protection. Why AI isn't good enough for student cheaters? Oh no! And Sarah is one of the people who experienced the Apple Vision Pro launch glitch. So congratulations! Thank you. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, February 6th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And at Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, thank you to everybody who sent well wishes uh, to us Californians, uh, seeing that we made the news worldwide. It was on the BBC. Was somebody in Denmark was saying they, they saw us on the news uh, for all of our rain. Uh, not going to lie, pretty intense evacuations, uh, even a few fatalities. Uh, so it, it was serious business. But just so you know, all three of us uh, are doing OK. So we feel very lucky. Thank you. Indeed. Indeed. Don't worry about us till we tell you to. <laughs> and then fuss a lot. <laughs> and then go crazy. <laughs> All right, let's start with the quick hits. Meta announced it will expand its labeling of synthetic imagery in the coming months to include images made with tools other than Meta's own models. Meta began labeling those when it detected them since it launched Imagine with Meta back in December. The company president, Nick Clegg, says that the company has worked with other companies through the partnership on AI Form to create technical standards to help increase detection. That includes watermarks as well as automatic detection, even if watermarks have been removed. Clegg mentioned detecting images from tools made by Adobe, Google, Midjourney, Microsoft, OpenAI, and Shutterstock. So watch out. Sources told the Financial Times that China's SMIC has new production lines in Shanghai that are expected to produce five nanometer chips for Huawei as early as next year. The U.S. has been putting ever stricter rules in place against shipping any kind of chip technology to Chinese companies, including chip making machines, uh, if they use U.S. intellectual property. We've been covering that on DTNS, so I'm sure you're well aware. SMIC, though, is apparently using existing stock of U.S. and Dutch-made equipment that it got before the restrictions went in place. Current cutting-edge processes are three nanometers. You'll find three nanometer processes from companies like Taiwan's TSMC. But Huawei's designs and SMIC's processes have been narrowing the gap, and now they're real close. However, it does appear that SMIC is going to have to charge 40 to 50 percent more for its five and seven nanometer chips than TSMC does for equivalent processes. And SMIC's yield is a less than a third of TSMC's. So their process isn't equivalent in quality or cost. Speaking of TSMC, it announced it will build a second chip factory in Japan to go with the first one that's opening this February this month. Uh, the second plant should go into a production mode by 2027. This goes along with plants from TSMC being built in Arizona, in the United States, and Germany in the European Union. On Monday's show, we mentioned there were indications Microsoft was planning to bring more of its Xbox and PC titles to the Sony, PlayStation 5, and other platforms. Microsoft CEO of gaming Phil Spencer posted on X that the company will announce details for the future of Xbox next week. The Verge's sources say this announcement has been moved up from the end of the month thanks to the leaks of potential cross-platform game announcements. Yeah, we're going to hear more about this from Scott Johnson if you want a little deeper dive on it. Uh, that'll be on tomorrow's show. YouTube TV has more than 8 million subscribers now. The cable replacement service, don't confuse it with plain old YouTube. This is the one where you can watch, you know, ABC, CBS, TNT, etc. It is now the largest service of its kind, right ahead of Hulu Plus Live TVs 4.6 million and Sling TVs 2.1 million, but still smaller than traditional cable TV services like Comcast Xfinity. That one has 14.1 million. Uh, this is probably because YouTube TV got the rights to NFL Sunday ticket this season. That has boosted a lot of interest in YouTube TV. It also boosted Google's overall strategy for increasing subscription revenue to supplement ad revenue. As for that plain old YouTube, it now has 3 million channels and reports 1 billion hours of viewed daily and also added a new odd option in the Android and iOS mobile apps. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen this yet, but apparently it'll crop up and give you the option to create a feed of videos like a row themed off color. So you can be like, give me a row of 
red videos or green videos. I don't know. Maybe if you have like a themed party or something. Yeah. Or chill beats. You just want them to all be blue. I don't know. <laughs> now you've got the option. <laughs> yeah. uh, Nintendo updated a previous forecast of Switch console sales and now says it expects to sell 15.5 million in its current fiscal year, which ends in March. That's up from 15 million. Nintendo said the Super Mario Brothers Wonder Game had a good start following its release in October with 11.96 million units. The company also said the Mario movie is helping sales of older titles like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and is also planning launches of new games based around characters from the Mario world, including Donkey Kong, Princess Peach, this quarter. Analysts who spoke to CNBC also said they expect a new Nintendo Switch to come out this year. Yeah, so they can thank Chris Pratt. <laughs> Mozilla introduced a privacy monitoring service called Mozilla Monitor Plus. They'll be charging $8.99 a month. Service monitors more than 190 sites that sell information gathered from publicly available sources like social media apps, uh, browser tracking, et cetera. This is not dark web stuff. This is, uh, we found your information on the online and we collated it together and sold it to advertisers. Monitor Plus will notify you if it finds any of your information for sale and will take attempts to remove that information automatically. Uh, Mozilla is partnering with a company called OneRep on the scanning and takedown request part of the service. If information cannot be removed, Mozilla will still try to give you some further instructions to help you try to remove the information yourself. So they, they really want to go as far as they can in helping you scrub your personal info, your address, stuff like that, uh, your phone number, if you can. This, this is in addition to Mozilla Monitor, which is still free. That's the one that does look at the dark web and, and illegitimate sites. Uh, this, is, this is for legit sites. These, this is for, for info brokers. Uh, Sarah, I, I, had you thought about a service like this before? Is this something now, you ever wanted? This is not the same as something like Reputation Defender. Right where you're, it's, where you're actually kinda, trying to kind of right. go away online. No, it's it's it overlaps with it in that it's going after personal info, but it's not. I don't think Mozilla Monitor Plus, and I'm, I'm sort of guessing now, but I don't think it's going to try to like remove negative stories about you from news sites. This is more like I don't want my phone number and address out there, or or, or any other personal information. Yeah, I mean. I pay for Mozilla VPN. Um, I pay monthly. Uh, I feel like uh, Monitor Plus being nine bucks a month feels kind of high, but we looked up some competitors before the show started, and it doesn't actually seem like it's that expensive based on what other people are charging. I, you know, this is a service that if you care about it, you can part with the money, uh, and especially if you trust Mozilla, which a lot of people do. I think I think it's a great idea. I think, yeah, I mean, I haven't looked for my phone number online lately, but I've had the same phone number for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Probably not that hard to find, you know, if yeah. somebody really wants to. And, you know, the fewer robocalls I get as a result, the better. Yeah, uh, this is a good question. CR Poll in our YouTube uh, channel is asking if this is like incognito mode. Uh, no, it's not. This is not a browser thing. Even though it's made by Mozilla, this is this is an information service. So you don't have to even use Firefox if you don't want to uh, for this. Right. This is Mozilla having a team of people who go to these broker sites that exist and looking and saying, OK, uh, is Sarah's phone number here? Great. Let's issue takedown notices to these brokers to say, please don't sell that information. You don't have permission for it. Uh, it's It's stuff like that. So it's, it's a privacy protection service. It's fairly reasonably priced. Uh, delete me. What did we, did we find? Delete I me. I think it was which 12 a bucks service. a month. Yeah. It's something like, uh, you know, north of $10 a, a month. Uh, so it's, it's more than Mozilla and delete me is a perfectly legitimate one. There are also a lot of scammy ones out there that say they will do this sort of thing and then just take your money. Uh, so it's nice to have one from Mozilla, which I know a lot of people believe in and trust and, and would be willing to, to say, yes, I will, I will trust that you will actually try to do this for me. Yeah, I, I'm certainly one of those people. I've uh, used Mozilla products for a number of years, and I'm not sure that this is something that I care about enough. Um, maybe that's because I'm just, I'm very online. 
So I just, I feel like I've lost the war already, but, um, yeah, for anybody who's like, you know, the fewer, uh, broker services that end up, uh, sharing my information, you know, even if it's not nefarious, it's just annoying, um, to, to, to have an option to, to, to be able to minimize, if not completely eradicate that kind of stuff, not a bad idea. Yeah. And CR Paul clarified, uh, he did not mean to type incognito. He meant incogni, uh, which is another service like Delete Me. And yes, this is like uh, incogni, uh, except it's run by Mozilla. Well, Tom, we've got a new educational hustle. Ooh, you want to hear about what? it? Yes, please. All right. This one is adding human vibes to entrance essays that were originally written by AI. You might be a student, you want to get into that, you know, the good high school, you might say, eh, let's see what chat GPT can do for me. Forbes reports that kids applying to high school, they were talking about, so you're talking, you know, eighth grader age, pl applying to high school are using chat GPT and others to write personal essays for entrance, but then paying other people to then edit and DAI them to make them less obviously written by a bot. Editors from freelance marketplace Fiverr, that's Fiverr with two R's at the end, told Forbes that the goal is to replace repetitive tells, indicating that AI tools were involved in the first place. For example, um, using uh, the phrase, aligns seamlessly with my aspirations and stems mm -hmm. from a deep-seated passion. Perfectly fine, you know, sounds pretty grown up, unless everybody's using them. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden, wait a second, this doesn't seem like it was a personal essay at all. Yeah. These chatbots don't have your voice. Voice is, is, is what you sound like. And, and, and in, if you read an author uh, often enough, you'll start to understand their voice, right? Frank Herbert writes differently than Marion Zimmer Bradley. Uh, you, they both have a distinctive voice. And so you're going to get the same voice out of chat GPT for everyone, unless you tell it to write in a particular style, right? If you say, write my term paper like Lionel Richie, then it'll be different than other people, but it'll also <laughs> sound different than you. And that's the key here, right? Is the professor knows how you talk, from being in class, maybe, maybe not, but, but probably has at least some kind of idea. And so can easily tell, okay, this is not how you would talk. This is not how you would write it to get a chatbot to do this in your voice. You would need to train it on your own work, which would mean you'd have to write your own work in the first place. So it kind of, you know, obviates the point here if you're, you're trying to avoid doing the work. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's interesting that we've run up against one of the limits of these large language models. And even cheaters are like, yeah, if you really want to get away with it, you got to pay somebody to modify it. So it sounds like a human wrote it. Yeah. In fact, uh, um, uh, an alum and former editor in chief of the Cornell Business Journal, who now edits grad school applications uh, through capital editors uh, and wanted to remain anonymous, did tell Forbes that there are certain keywords, for example, tapestry in oh, particular, yeah. uh -huh. appearing in drafts from at least 20 of its clients in recent months. Um, his or her, I don't actually even know what his gender is, uh, but uh, added, there will be a reckoning. There are going to be a ton of students who unwittingly use the word tapestry on their own or other mm -hmm. words in their essay that may not be admitted in this cycle because now it's a red flag. There were other examples too. Um, other words, uh, for example, beacon or phrases like comprehensive curriculum, esteemed faculty, vibrant <laughs> academic community. Again, that all sounds like, yeah, you know, I want to go to your school. You know, you've got a vibrant ac academic community. I want to be a part of that. But you see enough of that stuff happening too often. And that's why you've got not, you know, it's, let's say I wanted to get into a school back in the day. And I say, Tom, you're just better at this than me. Can you just write my entrance, uh, you know, yeah, essay? Right. right? Like that would be something where it's like, all right, well, I'm pulling the wool over someone's eyes here because it wasn't really my voice. Now it's like, well, let's get chat GPT or something similar to do that. But now I don't want to be flagged for that. So I'm going to hire an editor to then polish it up to make it human. It's like it's a funny circular thing. Yeah. 
It's it is interesting because my 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 point about knowing your voice doesn't apply in an entrance exam, does it? Uh, so so it really wouldn't matter that they can't tell it's your voice. It just needs to not sound like ChatGPT's voice. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if a, a cle- more clever prompt would be able to do this, like avoid the regular tropes and words that people use in entrance uh, exam, uh, entrance essays, and then write me an essay. Uh, I, I, I'm sure somebody must have tried that out there. But I guess it's cheaper than paying someone to write an entire essay, like you're saying, to just have them punch it up and and look for those words. And it struck me when you were talking about all these words like tapestry and esteemed faculty, these are the kinds of things that the people judging these essays roll their eyes at already before there were ever even large language models in the picture because they're like, everybody uses these. It's why the large language models spit them out because they're trained on everybody else's essays that everyone uses all those overused words. So it overuses them because it doesn't know any better. It's, it's a really interesting quirk of how this stuff works. Yeah, I know the, the whole idea of like, I want this to sound very professional but also very human. And Mm -hmm. so (laughs) instead of just doing it myself, um, for whatever reason, I'm kind of like, all right, let's do a first pass, use chat GPT. Then second pass, human helps. And then, you know, I don't know, hopefully I go to the school that I want to go to. I mean, this, this is all, you know, these are, these are little tips and tricks. I mean, it's not really I don't know. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with using the tools unless a school explicitly says, if you use uh, one of these models, you know, for an entrance essay, you know, you will automatically be, you know, barred from the school. I mean, that would be one thing, but otherwise I feel like this is just, this is, this is what uh, anybody, I was about to say kids, but anyone of any age is going to do. Like, you kind of game the system. You see you see where you can get. And I think it's actually it's actually pretty smart to be like, thank you, ChatGPT. All right, a uh, person who used to work uh, at Cornell for many years, can you just like punch this up and make me sound really great? I, it's, it's an interesting thought. Like, using ChatGPT as a tool to get you started doesn't bother me. But using ChatGPT as a tool to get started for someone else to finish. Now it suddenly really bothers me. Um, But maybe it just shows your organizational skills and your, your ability to delegate. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it, it kind of does bother me as well, but at the same time, I think that there are, you know, especially when you're in the educational system, there are certain things people aren't very good at. You know, some people are extremely smart, but are really bad at taking tests. You know, this is maybe another one of those things where it's like, gosh, I really want to put my best mm-hmm. foot forward. I'm just, I don't think I'm, I'm going to just saying sound it's a good. bad way of determining who should get in. Is what well, that, that too. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I think it always was that way. Yeah. You know, yeah. If we're looking at, at those. And I, I think it also shows the limits of what these large, large language models can do. They, they cannot capture the human voice, uh, as, as well as an actual human. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Uh, folks, if you want a recap of the week's tech headlines, a lot of people are like, you know, sometimes I wish there was just a weekly show. We got it for you. Not only that, uh, but it includes insights on how technology affects and disaffects communities of color. Check out The Tech John, hosted by Rob Dunwood, Stephanie Humphrey, and Terrence Gaines. They dive into the top tech stories of the week, delivered from points of view you don't always hear in mainstream media. New episodes land Tuesday afternoons. Find it wherever you get your podcasts or visit thetechjawn.com. More owners of the $3,500 minimum Vision Pro are reporting they forgot their passcode. And entering an incorrect passcode more than a couple of times will disable the Vision Pro and start a waiting period to try it again. If you can't remember the code after the waiting period, you're stuck. You can't do anything. Unlike, say, an Apple Watch, there's no way for you to reset the Apple Vision Pro and start over unless you have a $299 cable that lets you plug it into a Mac or an iPad, but they only sell those to developers. So you either have to pretend you're a developer or actually be a developer in order to give them the $299 to get the little dongle that would help you reset the Apple Vision Pro. Otherwise, you have to hike it into an Apple store or if you're not near an Apple store, which a lot of you aren't, you got to mail it into Apple, get them to erase and reset it and mail it back. Now, 
Sarah, as we mentioned yesterday, had a similar problem. You didn't forget your passcode, though. You did get it locked up and had to take it into the Apple Store for the same reason to get it reset. Uh, if you want her full story on that adventure, get Apple Vision Show. The first episode is out, applevisionshow.com. She tells the whole story to Eileen Rivera. But does it make you feel any better knowing you're not alone now that I you've seen all these other reports? Kind of. Um, so, yeah. So, again, uh, I, I will not... Um... Uh, go on and on about the story because I, I did detail it in, in 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 a lot of detail on Apple Vision Show. But uh, long story short, I am, and you know, there might be somebody out there being like, she forgot her passcode. I didn't forget my passcode. Uh, it's the same passcode that I use for my iPhone. Um, I, you know, I, I was able to do lots of- Now you're going to get somebody say you shouldn't reuse your passcode, but well, yeah, it was you, know not, what? you didn't forget it. That's the point. You, <laughs> you, there are lots of things I do wrong, but in this case, I knew my passcode. Uh, I, I had also, you, I, I had restarted uh, the pro several times and entered the passcode and, and, and was Successfully, able- right? It, yeah, yeah, exactly. So- that wasn't the issue. What I what I suspect happened, um, and I don't really know why, is that uh, because Eileen, co-host on Apple Vision Show, um, had been playing around with the Pro over the weekend, wiped it, gave it to me. So I was starting from scratch. I mean, she did she did everything right. Yeah. Something in there glitched, and it just got confused. It got confused. Um, I, you know, I was at the store. I'm not far away from an Apple store. So it wasn't like the end of the world for me to go in, but I had to go in, you know, because I was on the phone with them earlier and I was like, there's no remote wipe option. And they were like, no. Yeah. And like, honestly, like we don't, we don't even like, there's no like even literature for like how to like deal with you. You should just like go to the store. <laughs> when I got to the store, it was sort of the same thing where they were sort of like, huh, head scratching, like, this is weird, but I heard whispers, I heard whispers uh, among the uh, several employees that gathered around me to be like, what do we do? Um, I was not alone. Now, uh, that was uh, Monday, February 5th. By Tuesday, February 6th, all sorts of articles had been published about people who had forgotten their passcodes that had to do what I did. Now, again, Whatever happened in my case, um, it, it, the, the problem seems to be resolved. They did wipe uh, my unit while I was there at the store, went home, played around with it, all good. But um, it is a, you know, it highlights a, in, uh, I mean, to say like incredibly frustrating situation is minimizing it for some people. Because when I was on the phone, before I even went into a store where I was like, ah, we can't like just fix this remotely. You, you know, maybe it's a theft thing. You know, they're worried about me, whatever. You know, I'm thinking, what if I were, I don't know, I mean, up in the mountains on vacation somewhere really far away from an Apple store. A lot of people just don't live near an Apple store anyway. And, you know, the, you know, mail it in, get it wiped, mail it back. I mean, maybe you're looking at a week if you're lucky type thing. That is super disappointing for anybody who plunked down that much money for, for a unit, especially for anybody in the Apple ecosystem who's like, well, hold on a second. I don't have to do this with an iPad or an Apple Watch, as you mentioned. Um, I would be surprised if Apple didn't change its tune sooner than later. Weird Ami asked, did they tell you how to wipe the unit so you can do it at home? No. Because you can't. You can't. The way you can wipe the unit is plug it into a Mac or an iPad. And the only way to plug it into a Mac or an iPad is to have the proper dongle. And the only way to get the proper dongle is to spend $299 and be a developer. So the workaround here, the reality is you can sign up for a developer account, pay the $99 a year, tell them you're a developer, order the $299 dongle. Now you're now it's a $399 dongle, uh, I guess $398. And then... And then have the ability to do it yourself, but that's not worth it, especially if you are near an Apple store. It's much cheaper to just go down there and be like, fine, this is inconvenient, but do it for me. Uh, I don't think they expected to have to do this a lot. I also don't think they are doing it a lot. Um, it, it doesn't sound like this is a widespread issue. It's a unique issue that some people are forgetting their passcodes, maybe because they didn't want to turn on optic ID, maybe because they handed it to a friend to use and the friend typed the passcode in wrong. Uh, and Sarah, yeah. it, it can be tricky to type the passcode in, right? 
Sort of. I mean, the whole typing on the Vision Pro in general, I find, uh, I don't want to say lackluster, but it, it takes, it takes some practice. Yeah. And one of the first things that you do is set a passcode, you know, so you're kind of, you know, doing, doing this whole thing. And I could see, I can see again, I swear to y'all, I did not forget my passcode, but I could see Because you got past the passcode screen. I think that's the key information here is you didn't get stuck on the passcode key and screen and get locked out. You got past it and then it locked out. Several times. Yeah. Like I'm not like embarrassed or whatever, you know, like if I forgot the passcode, I would just tell everybody, but uh, people did. And um, I think And a lot of people are saying that they didn't forget the passcode either. And it also still locked up. So there's a few other people like you out there. There, there, I, 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 I suspect know. it's what because we were doing the weird thing where Eileen set it up for herself. Yep. She followed all the rules that Apple says about gifting or selling an Apple Vision Pro. She wiped it. She removed it from her iCloud account. She did all the things right and gave it to Sarah. But there's a glitch. There's a glitch in there that stopped it from from being able to be handed over. And frankly, if Apple had profiles on this thing, this would not have even been an issue. We would have just had a profile for Eileen and a profile for Sarah. Yeah, and um, uh, this actually got me down a rabbit hole of like, well, hold on a second. I mean, what if, uh, you know, I had bought the Vision Pro, nobody else had used it, I set it up, and I just wanted, you know, a friend who came over, my mom, you know, whoever, just like, I'll put it on and, you know, play around a little bit. There are guest profile options for the Vision Pro, but Just they're one. very, but they're very it's, limited. It's, I used it. It, it. it, it, if you're not careful, it won't let you do anything. So you have to explicitly set it up to say yes, let the guest do everything I have. Yeah. Uh, so it's all or nothing, and it, it's not personalized to the guest. It's not like a Tom guest profile. It's just a guest profile, and every time you log in, you have to train it to your eyes. Every time it will not yep. remember that. Yeah. So it's, it's super annoying. Um, must be between <laughs> four and 25 letters uh, was asking. Uh, it sounds like an anti theft measure, but it wasn't that either. Was it because we, we tried the things that, that would have tricked it into not being anti theft. I mean, I think, you know, uh, because what ended up happening and this was part of why I was like, something's, something's up here um, was that, you know, put in my passcode, put in my passcode, not right, not right, not right. And then I get like a, okay, you're permanently locked out. I was like, forever? Like (laughs) Like, that? Just like that? Yeah. And then it was like, you know, I would sort of just like get frustrated, put it down, put it back on later. And it was like, you're locked out for seven hours and three minutes. Yeah. Which is what it does when you when you put in the wrong passcode multiple times. Yeah. But I mean, that would have been, you know, it's like, am I permanently locked out or is it seven hours or is it 13? I got that at one point and I just went to bed. Um, and yeah, in the morning it was like, yeah, what's your passcode? You know, something, something's up, something's up. So yeah. that, that is the anti nobody has that protection. Yeah. The seven hour timeout is to, to stop people from just trying to hack into it. But you were Which entering the right passcode, so it was not that. Um, I don't know. I feel like this thing is not meant to be shared. Very clearly, they did not test it with sharing. And yeah. this happens with every new device when it launches. There's always some glitch. Enough people have it that it seems widespread. It's always a, a, a small slice of people. And it's something they didn't encounter until... They they got it into mass numbers of people, right? Because they just mm-hmm. didn't test for these sort of scenarios. Like, yeah. why would you share it? Why would you buy? Why would one person buy it and then give it to someone else immediately? Why would you do that? Well, we did. Well, so take yeah. that, Apple. I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> we can't all have these, you know, expensive devices. Sometimes we have to share these things. Yeah. All right. Real quickly before we get out of here, let's check out the, oh, that's the wrong one. Mailbag. There we go. <laughs> Allison Sheridan wanted to make a clarification to yesterday's show regard, uh, regarding Qi charging. Allison says, I just re-listened to the show, and at one point you said that Qi 2 will work with any phone. We should have said any Qi 2 compatible phone. The iPhones are already Qi 2 compatible, of course, but that may not be true with other manufacturers. I don't know this for certain, but it would make sense that the coils and the phones would have to be redesigned to match up to the chargers. I tried to download the Qi version 2.0 spec, but they don't have it available yet. They explicitly say that you can't read it. So 
a Qi phone that is not Qi 2 will charge with a Qi 2 charger at the slower rate. It will not charge at the faster Qi 2 rate. Everything is backwards compatible. So that that's what I was meaning when I said uh, any phone should work. Also, it, I, I guess, you know, it should be obvious that if a phone doesn't have Qi charging capability at all, if it's not meant to wirelessly charge, it also wouldn't work uh, with any Qi charger. Uh, but yes, thank you, Allison, for the clarification. Patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. Blue Sky is now open to everyone to sign up. But do we care anymore? We're going to talk about our various social strategies these days. Stick around. <laughs> Just a reminder, you can catch our show live because we do it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking about that plan by Microsoft and Xbox to bring Xbox titles to other platforms, including the PS5 with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>